following day. And the, the excitement builds so much that, that you almost wish you could just kind of fast forward through the night to get to the good event. And so you don't want to miss out, and so you, you make sure you set, like, not just one alarm, but, you know, you set two alarms. And you realize that's really futile. There's no point in doing it because you're only sleeping in about 30 or 45-minute intervals anyways. And you wake up, you look at the clock, and like, is it time yet? No, it's not yet time yet. You fall back asleep. Is it time yet? No, it's not yet time yet. And you build this sense of excitement. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a vacation that you had planned to get away on. And you knew your flight leaves really early in the morning. And so you don't want to miss that flight. And so you, you, you're so excited. You're just so fired up. Or, or maybe it was the night before you got married. You know, you're just so excited. You just, you just can't wait. And, and you just want to get through that night. Or for children... Oftentimes it happens right around, you know, Christmas morning, you know, the, the excitement of, of presents. And, you know, for us in our family, the excitement grows so great. We tell our kids, you can only tell me about you're excited at 7 a.m. in the morning, right? Or maybe it's Easter morning, that, 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 that sense of excitement, that, that, that joy because you get to go out and you get to look for these eggs and you get to find these incredible chocolate-covered things that just taste oh so good and, and you just get so excited. I don't know, this morning happens to be April Fool's Day. I'm sure you all are aware of that. And I got, someone sent me a picture of, you know, how can you squash your children's excitement a little bit? I don't know if you... Hey, I let the kids leave first. I know it's a little late. You can't pull these stunts until before noon, so it's too late anyways. But you might want to file that one away. But we've all been there, right? We've all been in that place of incredible excitement, that, that incredible moment of anticipation where you just can't wait for the new day to begin. Well, today we come and we gather on Easter morning. This opportunity to come and to, to celebrate this good news of Jesus, uh, to celebrate just the reality of his resurrection. But if you go back to the very first Easter morning, that wasn't actually the mood at all. There wasn't this sense of excitement. There wasn't this moment of joy. There's, there, there wasn't this reality of the disciples and the women who knew Jesus so well of just, of just waiting through the night and saying, I can't wait for the third day. I can't wait for Easter morning to happen. Because they were completely devastated. Filled with immense disappointment. In the passage we read from the Gospel of John, one of the biographies of Jesus we're actually told that Mary, along with some of the other women, got up early in the morning, not because they couldn't wait, but because they knew they needed to go to the tomb where Jesus, the one who they had believed, the one that they had hoped would be the Messiah, was now lying dead. And they were going there not to celebrate, not to get excited, not to, not to feel the sense of joy, but to prepare Jesus' body, his limp, dead body, for proper burial. And then we're told that when Mary got to the tomb, her disappointment then increased even more. Because when she got to the tomb and she noticed the stone had been rolled away, she looked into the tomb, and now not even the body lay there anymore. And we're told that Mary then went to tell some of the other disciples. Now, if you're hearing this story for the first time, you may think, well, well maybe she's come to this place, this, this realization that maybe Jesus has risen from the grave. Because if you go back and you follow the teachings of Jesus, there was this reality that Jesus spoke of that wasn't supposed to be a secret. That actually the people who didn't believe in him, those who opposed him, the religious authorities, knew this as well. That Jesus had spoken publicly that he would die, but that on the third day he would rise again. And so as you're entering into the story perhaps for the first time, you're thinking, well, well maybe this has been the moment for Mary. Maybe this has been the opportunity where now Mary is going to tell that the, the, the cobwebs have been whipped away, the fog has lifted, and says, oh yes, yes, it's been a crazy couple of days, but Jesus has risen, he is not here. It wasn't the case. Mary goes to find the other disciples, not to tell them of this great news, but rather to say, hey, can you come and help me find Jesus' dead body? Someone has moved it. Like, why would someone move it? Can you come and help me? 
And so two of the disciples, Peter and, and John, they tear off to the tomb to try to, to try to figure this out. And then Mary arrives later, likely after Peter and John have already left, and we see again this place of disappointment where she's looking into the tomb and Jesus is not there. One of the things I appreciate about the Bible is just how real it truly is. How it paints and captures the picture of the reality of what was going on. The struggles, the rough edges are not sanded away to make it more palatable. But rather we live in the reality of what was happening. And here was Mary, a woman who loved Jesus, a woman who followed Jesus, a woman who wanted to believe in Jesus, yet she was overcome with disappointment. It enables us, I think, to step into the story and to begin to allow ourselves the permission to also experience disappointment in life. Maybe you've been there, maybe you are there this morning. And maybe for you, Easter, you know, kind of isn't that great moment of celebration, and you're kind of just putting on the smile because everyone else is smiling. But you experience it. Life hasn't gone according to plan. That job that you had hoped would work out is no longer there. That, that, that relationship that you held in such high hope is starting to crumble away. Life is not going according to plan. And you sense that emotion of disappointment. And maybe your disappointment pushes it a little bit further to the place that not only are you a little disappointed with life, with your life, but you're disappointed with God. Because he seemingly has not come through as you had expected him to. I often wonder if that's what Mary was feeling. The sense of sadness, the sense of grief, not just simply because Jesus had died, but because God had disappointed her. Jesus had not done what she had hoped he would do. And we get this sense that she was so overwhelmed with her disappointment that that's all that she could focus on. Because then John tells us that as she looked into the tomb, she saw two men, one sitting at the, where the head of Jesus would have been, the other at where the feet of Jesus would have been, and we're told that they were angels dressed in white. Now you would think that might kind of wake you up a little bit, kind of pull you out of your slumber, but, but Mary was so focused on her disappointment, all she wanted to know was, where is Jesus? I mean, these men asked the question, why, why are you crying? Mary's probably thinking, really? I don't want to have a conversation with you. Where is Jesus? And then we're told that Jesus appears. Now we can jump into this story far too quickly, but Jesus appears and Mary's back is turned to him. She, she can't even turn until he speaks. And Jesus too asks a question. And Mary doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's a gardener. And again, she just wants to know, where have you laid Jesus? And then Jesus speaks again with one word. One word that is so significant to us here today. He calls her by name. And he says, Mary. And in that moment, we're told she recognizes Jesus. And she's so excited. She's so probably so overwhelmed. Her tears of sadness are probably now tears of joy as she embraces Jesus and cries out, Teacher, Teacher. In that moment, her life was changed. Jesus is like, Mary, go and tell the others. Go and tell the others the good news of what has happened. I think one of the ways that the Bible really begins to become more than just an intellectual pursuit for us is when we begin to allow ourselves to enter into the story, to enter into Mary's story. And here we see the reality of, again, this incredible principle that we see throughout the Bible, throughout the life of Jesus, is that Jesus desires to meet us wherever we are. 
think sometimes we think, you know, maybe following Jesus, maybe being a Christian is about, is about making sure that I live the good life, that I kind of shiny up my life, and then it'll be presentable to God. Yet here in this story, this very first Easter morning, we see Jesus meeting Mary right in her disappointment, which reminds me that if Jesus can meet her there, then Jesus can meet you wherever you are as well. But there's a second thing I take away, and that is it was personal. Jesus called her by name. It's one of the great things we see throughout the Bible, this desire that God wants to know us and that we will know him, that it is a a relationship to have with us, that it is personal, that it is intimate, that it becomes significant. You see, here we are today, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years later, not in Jerusalem, but in Paris, Ontario, celebrating the event that Mary experienced for the first time, the incredible reality of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus that not only changed Mary's life, but has the ability to change our lives as well. I think one of the dangers when we look at the resurrection is we simply think of it as a historical event, as something that happened many years ago. Or, or maybe we become just simply over-sentimental, that, you know, we, we, we love Easter and, and we love these singing these songs, but at the end of the day, we kind of walk out of the church and it doesn't really make a difference in our lives. And so this morning, I just want to take a few moments to to simply ask and address the question of what difference does Easter make? I mean, really, what difference can it make in my life? What difference can it make in your life? So that it doesn't simply become an event we celebrate, but rather a reality, a reality that we live. I think one of the first differences I begin to see is the fact that because of the resurrection, It validates not only who Jesus is, but everything that Jesus has said. As you look at the teachings of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, Jesus kept telling people over and over and over again, I will show you that I am the Messiah. I will show you that I am the Savior. Not simply by what I say, but by the fact that I will rise on the third day. You know, historically, Jesus was not the first person in Jerusalem, in Israel's history, to claim to be the Messiah. There were others who had come before him. A guy by the name of Judas the Galilean, or Thaddeus. They too entered into Jerusalem, wanting to free the Jews from the oppression of the Romans. They too gathered people around them. Not a few handfuls, but hundreds and even thousands of people. They were the ones claiming to be the Messiah. They were the ones who who believed in their cause so much that they also went against the Romans. And they too, like Jesus, were executed for what they believed. Yet I'm betting many of us have never heard of Judas the Galilean or Thaddeus. I can almost guarantee you that there are not people hanging out in Paris or in other places in this world celebrating the movement of Judas the Galilean or Thaddeus. Because in Jesus' case, he didn't simply claim to be the Messiah. He didn't simply gather followers around him. He didn't simply die for what he believed in. He had the ability to rise from the grave. And that begins to change everything. You see, the fact that Jesus rose from the grave brings Jesus out of the place of simply being a good example, out of the place of of, of, of just simply being a great teacher. It allows him to hold to the claim that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. You see, many people oftentimes don't refute the reality of the empty grave. The challenge is in understanding what happened to Jesus' body. Some would claim that it was a great scheme of the disciples, 
that they were plotting this, that because they knew that Jesus had taught this, that, that maybe they would steal the body and then try to hide the dead body away somewhere and then tell others that Jesus had actually risen. It's a fairly, it's a, it's a thought that goes back because that's actually what the opponents of Jesus believed which is why they sealed the tomb, which is why they placed guards at the tomb, which is why they wanted to make sure that Jesus' body would not be taken because they were afraid that if this got out, this would be the worst deception around there. But if you look back at the disciples, you realize that they weren't even thinking this. Heck, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. They were off hiding in their homes, fearful of what was about to happen to them next. And so to think that they would then steal the body and then weeks later march down the streets of Jerusalem proclaiming that Jesus had risen? It doesn't seem to make sense. Others may say, well, maybe it was the the opponents of Jesus, those who, who didn't believe in Jesus, that maybe they took the body and they hid it away, waiting for the disciples to come forward and to proclaim this wonderful news of the resurrection. But scholars believe that the movement of Jesus grew so quickly in Jerusalem over such a short period of time. It's because as the disciples were on the streets in Jerusalem proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, there was no rebuttal from those who opposed him. There was no body to show. And so all they could do was threaten the disciples, the followers of Jesus, with imprisonment or even worse. And so if Jesus rose from the grave, the difference it makes is that if that promise is true, then every other promise that God gives to us, that Jesus speaks to us, is true as well. It's the promise that that we can truly be forgiven. That no matter how bad our past or our present may be, That because of Easter, the difference it makes is that through Jesus, we can be forgiven. We can begin to experience that abundant life, that that life worth living. We can live with hope and assurance that even in the midst of difficulty, even in the reality of death, we can hold to the hope of eternal life. And so as we go back and we we read through the Bible or or as we claim the promises of Jesus, we realize that if the resurrection is true, it's not only true news, it becomes good news for us as well. What difference does the resurrection make? It becomes an even greater power and reality in our lives. Again, it's, it's remarkable to just notice the difference in the disciples' behavior. If you, if you read through the last couple of chapters of any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and then carry on into the book of Acts, you see this radical transformation in these men and women who were fearful, who had betrayed, who had denied Jesus, were now the ones moving forward with this movement. And nothing would deter them. Not imprisonment, not beating, not even death. And it was the Apostle Paul in speaking to a group of Christians in Rome who who really understood this. As he says, this same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. That's one of the great differences of Easter, is recognizing that that following Jesus is, is not about sin management. It's not about trying to just correct certain behaviors. It's about realizing that the risen Lord lives with us and in us. That he is the one who gives us the strength and the power and the comfort and the ability to overcome whatever we face in life and ultimately in death. You know, being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that there's not moments of disappointment. There's, there's, not, there's not times of discouragement. There's not seasons of sadness. But what it does mean is that these will not lead us to despair. That because of Jesus, because of his resurrection, we can live with a sense of hope. We can understand this incredible sense of peace. And then finally, what difference does Easter make? I believe it gives us a sense of purpose. 
Two simple words that Jesus so often said to those who were interested in knowing more of him. Follow me. Follow me. It's an invitation to come and live life with him. To live all of life with him. Uh, to recognize that, that when you put your faith in Jesus, it's not just then suddenly sitting around twiddling your thumbs and waiting for the promise of eternal life. But it's that promise that can be lived and experienced right here, right now. That sense of knowing that our identity, our security, is found in Jesus. And so suddenly we begin to live life with him and for him. The difference that Easter makes in my life is that no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I'm speaking with, no matter what is, is taking place, I desire to live life in a way that honors Jesus in all things. And so what difference does Easter make? The difference is that it can begin to change and transform our lives when we allow it to be more than just an event and to become a reality for you and for me. Now I recognize that for all of us in this room, we are different places in life. For some of you here this morning, you, you may be skeptical of all that I have said, of all that the Bible says, of all the songs that are sung, But that's okay. I want to simply ask you this question. Don't you want the resurrection to be true? Isn't it in your heart of hearts you want this to be true? Because if the resurrection is true, it means this world matters. It means that you matter. It means that life is not futile. That life does not end in death, but there is an even greater hope. Don't you want it to be true so that you can begin to experience the good of Jesus in life? And so my suggestion would just simply continue to lean into your questions. Continue to ask about your doubts. And understand here, as this church, we desire to lead people to Jesus and so understand that you can belong before you believe. We would love you to be a part of us to be part of us exploring every week, what does this Jesus mean in my life here this day? As followers of Jesus, it doesn't mean that we run away from our questions. It doesn't mean that we don't have moments of doubt. It means we have the opportunity to come to Jesus as we are and know that he will meet us there. For others here this morning, perhaps you're in a place where in your mind, you know the resurrection is true, but it has not yet become good news for you. And maybe God is nudging you to take that step of faith. When as Mary experienced on that day, her faith in Jesus became personal, became real. Where you received Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and said, I want to start living life with you. Perhaps as this service goes on, there's an opportunity for you just to make that a reality. And if you do, I would love to have further conversation with you. My email is in the bulletin. You can grab me after the service, but allow the true news of Jesus and his resurrection to become good news for you. And then finally, there's some of us in this room who have taken that step, who have decided to follow Jesus in the midst of all of life, that you know that it is true news. You've experienced it, that it is good news. The question I have for you is, is this a reality in your life? Because what you start to see in the movement of the early church is that people were drawn to Jesus because of the change and the transformation in those who claimed him as their Lord. People are window shopping for Jesus. People are looking for hope. 
And so what's on display in your life? As a follower of Jesus, it's not just about holding to the things that we know are true. It's about recognizing the goodness in Jesus and living it out in our lives as well. And so may we be a community of faith that doesn't just simply hold to the resurrection as being true news, allow it to be good news as it transforms our lives, as we become people of hope, as we are filled with a sense of joy, that we live with a sense of anticipation of what God is going to do next in our lives. Because we know this, that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. Let us pray. And so Jesus, as we come before you this day, we give thanks that you are the God who meets us wherever we are. That you are a God that does not remain distant, but wants to know us personally by name. And so Jesus, wherever we may be, in a place of question, in a place of doubt, may you meet us there. For those that are experiencing disappointment and discouragement in their lives, may you meet them there. For those that are wanting to take that step of faith and to say, Jesus, I want you as a part of my life, may you lead them there. And for those that have made the decision to follow you, may we live with a sense of joy. May we live with a sense of hope so that the resurrection is not something we simply talk about. It's a reality that we live as we know this same power that rose you from the grave lives, lives in us. So we ask all this in your name, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen.